Hey guys, so I'm getting ready for clinic tomorrow. We have uh, the group of students that I'm currently working with have their very first ICU day tomorrow. And I know probably most of them, maybe many of them are a little nervous, maybe a little apprehensive. I haven't worked with this group. Four out of the five of them I haven't worked with before. And so they have probably lots of feelings happening inside of them, much like many of you who are preparing for your first ICU rotation. You may or may not have had your clinical instructor before, and you're a little nervous as you prepare to go into an ICU room knowing that the stakes are a little greater. So if you've already done a floor rotation, general care, you've probably administered small volume nebulizers, MDIs, DPIs, maybe some PEP therapy or some, some metaneb therapy, maybe an IPPB if you still work in a region that still has those archaic machines in use. Um, but nonetheless, when you walk into an ICU room, you're taking care of the sickest patients in the hospital. And so the stakes are a little higher. A mistake on your part can equate to detrimental effects on the patient. And so you need to be aware of that. And so you should be a little more nervous than usual. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now from, a, from an instructor standpoint, okay, if you tell me on your first day of ICU that you're not nervous, then I'm keeping a closer eye on you than everybody else because you should be nervous unless you've done this before, unless you're coming over in the respiratory therapist, the respiratory therapy after being an ICU nurse for, for two or three or five or 10 years or, or somehow already working in the ICU arena for 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 several years and have extensive experience in the ICU work prior to, to to this rotation, which is very few students, by the way. I mean, that's very few of you out there, okay? So maybe you were a paramedic, maybe you were, you know, a, a CNA working in an ICU and you've seen intubated patients before and you've worked with them, uh, you know, and you see a patient who you think is sedated and they open their eyes and look at you, but they can't communicate with you. Unless you have that experience, then you should be nervous as hell, okay? Honestly, you should be extremely nervous. And that's a good thing because that's your inner safety mechanism that's going to say, before I do X, I'm going to check with my instructor, okay? So that I understand that I'm operating in a safe and an appropriate manner as I'm learning how to do this job and learning my craft as a respiratory therapist, okay? So don't ever shy away, don't ever be afraid to say, man, I'm, I'm really nervous right now, especially on the first or second day of ICU rotation. Now, as you move through each day, each day should be a little bit, little better. So if you're super nervous on day one, on day two, you're probably still gonna be nervous, but you shouldn't be as nervous as day one, okay? Especially if your clinical instructor is doing their job in exposing you and teaching you and walking you through the things that you should be doing and expecting in the ICU. So I just wanna preface with that, okay? Now, beyond that, why am I doing this video? Well, I'm doing this video because I wanna share a tool with you that I've created that I think is extremely important. Okay, and I have it right here. It's just a little checklist. Okay, and what this checklist is, is the information you should have before you walk into the room. Okay, and then once you walk into the room, where do I start? Because there's so many elements to the game when, you come, when it comes to ICU uh, care that you're gonna to need to be aware of. And if you start training your mind from the get-go to be aware of these things and look at these things, then you're going to develop into a quality respiratory therapist a lot quicker than you probably ever thought you would be, okay? So here's the problem I've seen in the past. You say, okay, I see you. I'm taking care of a ventilated patient, right? And so I gotta go in and I gotta do my vent check. First of all, can we eliminate the term vent check Okay, I'm kind of echoing some words that were spoken yesterday in my class, which many of you probably weren't weren't there, uh, but the few of you that were, you've already heard this. But for the rest of you, the term vent check means writing down numbers. 
Okay, you don't go into an ICU room to perform a vent check. You go into an ICU room to assess the patient and to assess everything evolving around that patient. Okay, so it's not just the numbers on the ventilator. And you're probably expert. If you've been doing ventilator checks for, for a couple of weeks, then, then you may be an expert at ventilator checks. But that is, that's a weak, that's a weak um, scale to assess how well you're doing an ICU. The question is, do you know your patient? Do you know why your patient's here? Do you know if they're getting better? What do the numbers on a ventilator tell you? And ultimately, are you doing what needs to be done for your patient? Okay, And the only way you know that is if you start in a very systematic manner and working your way from before you enter the room to upon entering the room to upon approaching the ventilator. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this checklist doesn't even include the ventilator. Okay, there's one little blip in here that mentions ventilator. Okay, but this is everything that should be done before you even look at the ventilator because my goal is to train my students to be quality respiratory therapists and understanding that the patient is what we're caring for, not the ventilator. Okay, does that make sense? So, here we go. Before you ever enter the room, you should gather this significant data from your chart. The first thing you need to know is date of admission and date of intubation. Okay, you need to know when they were admitted and when were they intubated. This is going to give you valuable information as to how long the patient has been here and how long they've been intubated. Look, ventilator associated pneumonia is a real deal. And so when do your ears perk up to start watching your patient for signs of ventilator-acquired, ventilator-associated pneumonia? Okay, that's important. The only way you know that is if you're in the window of when ventilator-acquired pneumonia starts to show up. Okay, so it's important to know those dates. It's also important to know why your patient is here. So your HMP of the current admission, were they here because of a car wreck? Do they have a heart attack at home? Are they COPD exacerbation? Are they asthma exacerbation? Exactly what brought them to the hospital this admission, okay? Now, after that, it's important to understand any significant medical history because you may have a patient that comes in from a motor vehicle accident, okay, and they have, let's just say they have multiple trauma to their entire left side and they were intubated upon arrival, okay? That's good to know. But that care of that patient is going to be very different if it's a 20-year-old with no prior medical history versus a 67-year-old with an extensive COPD history, okay? Your, your, your numbers on your ventilator, your ventilator management are going to be two completely different approaches to caring for those patients. So, so prior medical history is important to understand before you ever even step into the room. The next thing you're going to know is their latest ABG. Okay, and I just say the latest because you need to know where they are now when you walk into the room because that gives you signals as to should I fix something? Do we have a ventilation problem? Do we have an oxygenation problem? Do we have a metabolic problem? What is going on with my patient from an arterial blood gas standpoint? And and is there anything that I need to address? Okay, now it doesn't hurt also to know where the ABGs came from. So what did they look like on admission to what do they look like now? Okay, but you definitely have to know where you are now before you walk into the room on any given day. The other thing you need to know is chest x-ray. You got to look at your chest x-rays, people. Okay, you need to know, first of all, how do the lung fields look? Okay, maybe we need to adjust our PEEP setting. Okay, maybe we have some new onset of, of infiltrates that we need to be assessing, which probably ties into the length of, of mechanical ventilation, which is the date of which they were intubated, correct? So, so those things are important. Um, you probably also need to know if there's any, any uh, rib fractures, if there's a developing pleural effusion. Um, things like that are very important. You also, before you walk in a room, need to know, do I need to re-secure or readjust the positioning of my endotracheal tube? Because if you're in the tracheal tube is right main stem and you go into the to to the room and you don't have any idea that your that your AM chest x-ray shows this, 
then, then other than the fact that you're going to have absent breast sounds on the left, you may not even register that they're right main stemmed, right? And what if the night shift therapist told you, hey, we're absent breast sounds on the, on the left? So, so crackles on the right, absent breast sounds on the left. And then you go in and hear the same thing and you don't even think twice about it because you never looked at the chest x-ray. So you have to assess your chest x-ray, okay, for proper placement. Not just lung fields, but proper placement of the endotracheal tube. What if it's eight centimeters above the carina? You're at risk for, a, for an accidental extubation that you could have prevented if you knew that you were starting out your day at eight centimeters above the carina. So you need to know the window that that needs to be in, and you need to assess it prior to going in. So the next thing is look at your CBC so you know your white blood cell count, and you know your red blood cell count, and most importantly, you know your hemoglobin count. Because if you're having a hard time oxygenating a patient, it may be related to your CBC count rather than the efficiency of your lungs. Okay, and then finally, your current respiratory therapy orders. What am I told to do with this patient? What are the parameters that I'm working within so that I know that if I need to make an adjustment, I can and I have orders that support it, and what therapy needs to be provided to this patient based off of the direction from the medical team, okay? So you got to know those things prior to ever going into the room, okay? So don't step, into, don't step foot into an ICU room without knowing those things. Now, once you enter the room, okay, you have all this information, you, you, you have a, a, a picture of what the patient presents with, okay? And you know your ABG, you know your chest x-ray, you know your HMP, you know all that stuff that I just talked about, right? Now, I'm going to walk in the room and I'm going to care for my patient. Where do I start? Do I walk straight to the ventilator and start writing down the settings? Absolutely not. Several things you need to observe as you enter the room and where you start when you're entering the room, okay? So the first thing is, is first of all, how does the patient look? When you walk into a room, the first thing you should do is observe the surroundings of the patient and the patient. Okay? So how does the patient look? Do they look agitated? Do they look comfortable? Are they awake? Are they asleep? Are they sedated? Like, what does the patient look like? Okay? Uh, one of the things uh, that I have on here further down is the respiratory pattern. You can look at their pattern and see how they're breathing within three to five seconds of walking into the room. And so you should do so. Okay, this is all how does my patient look. Okay, don't be blinded by the ventilator and by the monitors and all the beeps and the noises you're going to hear. And it prevents you from looking at the person that you're actually there to take care of. So look at your patient. And note this, okay? Anything worth noting is worth noting. What does that mean? That means if they're in a C collar, note that they're in a C collar. Before you go positioning that patient, you probably want to check with the nurse to see if they're in C-spine precautions, okay? The, the C collar is an indicator to you that I need to check before I do anything with this patient that may uh, compromise their their um, cervical situation, whatever it might be, okay? So anything is worth noting. If they have an external fixator on, so you'll hear it called an X-fix on a lower, lower extremity uh, X-fix, then note it and just know, yeah, this is my patient. They have a fix, an external fixator on their lower legs. They have, um, you know, uh, whatever it may be. Maybe they're on a cooling blanket and they're on a cooling protocol. Whatever that is, that's worth noting. So anything worth noting, if you say, is this important? It's worth noting, okay? So note anything worth noting. The second thing you need to look for is, is my emergency airway equipment present? Do I have an Ambu bag at the bedside, okay? An ICU room should have a clean, usable Ambu bag and mask and peat valve at the bedside. So check for it. If your patient has a tracheostomy tube, they should have an obturator at the bedside. They should have spare trachs at the bedside. All of those things are emergency artificial airway equipment, okay, and emergency equipment that needs to be present prior to you getting into your care, your actual hands-on care of that patient, okay? So the next thing I hear have here is, do they have an airway, an artificial airway? 
and you just need to check. Do they have a tracheostomy tube? Do they have an oral ET tube? Do they have a nasal ET tube? What is the artificial airway? And make note of it. The size, the placement, is it properly secured? Because if it's not, you should start by fixing that. Okay, so artificial airways are extremely important. They're 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 probably more than fifty percent of the reason our field actually exists, and you need to know that up front. Okay, the second thing are any lines, and when I say lines, I'm talking about peripheral IVs. I'm talking about central lines. Um, you know, um, IJ. You know, inner jugular lines, pick lines. Any lines where the patient is receiving medication, you need to take note of this, where they are, how are they positioned, do they look good. If they don't, you talk to the nurse. You don't fix it yourself, but you talk to the nurse. But this is you being a complete respiratory therapist and taking note of everything, okay? So if they have a line of some sort, which they most likely do, then the next step you should probably do is note the medications that are hanging and running through that line, okay? So do they have pain medicine running? Do they have sedation running? Why are these important? Because both of these will suppress the respiratory drive to breathe. So that may be your answer and is why your patient is not in a state of readiness to wean, okay? Because maybe they're too sedated. So do they have lines? Do they have medications, sed sedatives, um, pain medications? Do they have a uh, neuro, neuromuscular blocking agent? Maybe their own Nimbex, okay? All of those things are going to give you clues as to how your patient responds to you when you actually start caring for them, okay? If you have a patient on Nimbex and you suction them and they have coarse crackles and you suction them and you get nothing and you suction again and you get nothing and you suction again and you get nothing, you need to put two and two together that the reason I'm not getting anything when I suction this patient that sounds like crap is because the patient isn't coughing. So the crackles are all peripheral and I'm trying to suction right here, just right above the carina. So if the patient doesn't cough because they're paralyzed, that's your answer and understanding why your patient is not coughing, okay? If they're brain dead, that's your reason why they're not coughing and that's why your breath sounds are probably not going to get better throughout the day because without a cough you really can't bring the secretions to the point at which the suction catheter can grab them and remove them okay so hanging medications antibiotics paralyzing agents benzodiazepines pain medication are they running what about uh pressors for for cardiac function okay um Vasoconstrictors, those things are indicators as to your patient's overall state while they're in the ICU. And if you don't know what a drug is, look it up. Write it on your notebook. And when you get home, look it up or ask your clinical instructor and y'all talk about it. And, and, and that makes you smarter in the world of ICU. So the next time you hear somebody on Levafed, you know that this patient is somebody who's struggling to maintain an adequate blood pressure on their own. Okay? So so ask these things and, and, and ask what they are. When you see mannitol hanging, ask what is mannitol? Okay? It's not a it's not a, a, a drug. It is a drug to treat increased ICP, but it does nothing to the brain. It's actually a diuretic. So look into it and learn what it is and you'll become an overall well rounded respiratory therapist because of it. Okay? These are in no specific order, okay? You need to note your vital signs. What's your heart rate? What's your blood pressure? Okay, what's your oxygen saturation? What's your temperature? And then you also need to know your respiratory rate. And I promise you this much right here. Do not trust the nursing monitor for the respiratory rate. It operates off of abdominal movement, okay? And sometimes and oftentimes it's false. So don't take the respiratory rate off of the monitor. Either count it manually or then look at your ventilator. I told you I was going to mention the ventilator numbers here, and this is the spot. You can trust your ventilator when it comes to respiratory rate, okay, unless you have a false triggering happening, okay? But most of the times, the way your patient looks, you can count a, a, a manual respiratory rate and then compare to your ventilator, and they should match up. Okay, so don't get in the habit of looking at the monitor and saying, oh, the respiratory rate's 12 when they're actually breathing 36 times a minute. Okay, so keep that in mind. 
You want to assess breath sounds before you ever even talk about your ventilator. How does your patient sound? Are they wheezy? Are they, do they have crackles? You know, um, you know, is there a pleural friction rub? Are they, are they super diminished? Or, or are there any absent breath sounds? You need to know that before you ever even dare try to monitor your ventilator. Okay, I already mentioned respiratory pattern. And then the one thing I like to do and I like to encourage my students to do is take both your hands, put it on your patient's chest, and just feel a couple of breaths. Okay, see if you feel any frematis. See if you feel any, any vibrations happening on the chest wall. If you do, they may need to be suctioned. Okay, see if you feel bilateral equal expansion. If you don't, that may be your first clue that your patient is right main stem. You have good, good chest rise on the right and not good on the left, guess what? Your patient may be right main stem. You need to look into that. Now, a lot of this stuff ties in together. If you know your right main stem when you walk in, then your, then your frematis, your palpation, is actually going to support what you already knew. Okay, But it just gives you one more tool in your bag. I love to see students put their hands on patient's chest and go, this tells me this, and I go, yes, it does. That's exceptional, okay? It's not average. It's not barely getting by. It's not minimal. You made a B. It's boom. That's exceptional because you understand that you can use your hands to assess and to feel, okay? When you're listening to your breath sounds, listen for uh, cuff leaks, Okay, because you can hear a cuff leak if it's happening. Have your ears open during this entire process because you can walk into a room and you can hear a cuff leak if there's one present that's large enough. You can also hear water sloshing around in your ventilator circuitry. Okay, so be on the lookout for that. Have your ears open. Have your eyes open. You ever see the ventilator circuit kind of dancing back and forth, inhalation, exhalation, and you see it moving excessively? You probably have water in your tube that you need to see about getting out, okay? So do those things. Um, like I said, I have this checklist. I'm giving it to my students tomorrow. Any of my students, if you're watching this, this is what you got to look forward to, and this is where you're starting tomorrow off with, okay? If you're not one of my students and you're getting ready for your ICU rotation or you're already in your ICU rotation and you're thinking, hey, that looks like a good tool, I would like it, send me an email respiratorycoach at gmail.com. I'd love to send you a copy of it. I don't have a problem. This isn't anything that's, that's you know mine and you can't have it. It's only for my students. Look, all of this is to enhance the respiratory care profession beyond my reach, my direct reach with my students at my organization. Okay? So if you want it, you think it'll be beneficial, send me an email. I'll shoot you a copy of it. You can do what you want to with it. Share it with whoever you want to. And all it's intended to do is to promote your growth as a respiratory therapist in perfecting your craft. Go be great. Enjoy the journey. Okay? And remember, nerves are good. It doesn't feel like it all the time, but nerves are good. They protect you. They protect your instructor's license. They protect the patient from you doing something that you're probably not supposed to do. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you would, please hit the button up there in the top of the screen. You can subscribe to my channel. If not, and you want to check out another video, I recommend this one. It's going to pop up right up here on the screen here probably any second now. So good luck, guys. Have fun. Let me know if I can help you.